Okay, so we're back with uh, more of Season 9 of Friendship is Magic with The Last Crusade, which... Wait, no, I'm trying to put him in B. <laughs> um, which I find actually is kind of an interesting title, given the fact that it's not actually the last Cutie Mark Crusaders episode, because that's this one, but apparently this... What is this called? Like, Growing Up is Hard to Do? Was apparently supposed to be a Season 5 episode... Which I guess means that conceptually this is their last episode. So, I don't know. I think that's just kind of an interesting thing to point out. Here's the other fucking interesting thing to point out in this episode. We are over 200 episodes into Friendship is Magic at this point. And this is the first time in the show we have ever met a person from Scootaloo's family. I don't think it was until Flight to the Finish... That we actually saw her house. That was what confirmed that she wasn't homeless. And I I don't know what I really assumed. It's like I figured she had a family, but we never met them. And in this episode, you meet her two cool gay aunts. And then you meet her parents. Who have been out of Ponyville because they travel because her parents are the Irwins. <laughs> like, I think her dad actually had an Australian accent, too. But, like, yeah, they work in wildlife conservation. Like, study rare creatures and shit. And they travel the world to do that. Hi, Scoots. Yeah, we come back to go get you so we uh, we could be a family again. Like, what? Okay, wait. What? <laughs> Why did it take so long to meet her Ding Dang family? First of all. Second of all. I grew up with a crocodile hunter. I grew up watching Steve Irwin. So this, uh, this to me is just super neat and I really like that. But that's the plot of the episode. It's not just her parents are coming back. It's also her parents are coming back to move all their shit and to take their daughter with them. Scootaloo does not want to leave. Her friends don't want her to leave. Not only because, you know, we're friends. We've been a trio for nine years at this point. <laughs> But also, we have a business together, which, granted, they didn't do anything with it in Season 8. They don't do anything with it in Season 9 either. But it's like, we still have our mission as the Cutie Mark Crusaders to help ponies with any Cutie Mark-related troubles. We can't do that if it's just two of us. We need the whole trio. Excuse me. And throughout the episode, we try various things. To convince Scootaloo's parents to let her stay. Doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. And the episode ends with them having this big party to honor the Cutie Mark Crusaders. And kind of making this last final plea about how important they are. And, you know, her parents have their calling. And it's something only they can do. And they have to do it together. And if they were separated from each other, they wouldn't be able to do it. And the Crusaders are the same thing. To which her parents say, okay, if that's the case, you can stay, kiddo. We love you. We'll keep in touch. It's it's good. It, it's a good episode. It is nice to finally meet her family. <laughs> I appreciated that. You know, having a bunch of characters that they've helped throughout the series show up and be like, yeah, like I want to show my support for the Crusaders because they did good work for me. This is why Equestria needs them. I think it's nice. Here's my problem with the episode. I don't mind Scootaloo staying. Although, kind of the idea of her having to leave, but talking about how, you know, even though your friend moves away, you can still stay friends, and even if you don't see them all the time, there's a part of me that's like, I kind of would have liked something like that. Especially because... It's not like the Crusaders were in a lot of the season. So it's not like, oh, Scootaloo moving away is this huge thing that's going to change everything. You could still just have her come back for this. And I don't know, maybe this happened when she was in town. Like, I, I could believe it. But at the same time, that's kind of what the last problem is. So it's not a complete missed opportunity. It's still, I think, an interesting idea that the show does tackle by the end. No, the thing that to me keeps this episode... From It's a lot like Ponyville Confidential, where it's this Cutie Mark Crusader episode that I think is really good, and it fumbles the ending. The way, to me, it fumbles the ending is the pony that's leading the 
party speech being like this is why the crusaders are important is the rambub that they helped at the start of the episode which in terms of this episode is a fine bookend but for what is their penultimate episode and again conceptually their actual last episode of the show why was it not diamond tiara giving that speech their old nemesis who has not said a word one line of dialogue maybe maybe she like said something as part of the chorus in the derby racer episode but not one what her mother has had dialogue since she has her mother has some dialogue here she's even here in the screen gap but diamond tiara since the end of season five got nothing and if at the end the person delivering the speech about why they are important and need to stay together is their old rival turned friend the person who they helped and it was that specific act that triggered them getting their cutie marks would work super well there's also the fact that what did diamond tiara figure out that she's good at i'm someone who's suitable suited for like leadership and politics because i'm good at getting people to do what i want which again i think is just really funny but given the fact that what are we trying to do here we are trying to convince scootaloo's parents let scootaloo stay so we're trying to get them to do something we want yeah that's actually kind of right up diamond tiara's alley so you could kind of see how far she's come as well like yes i am still trying to get people to do what i want and i'm working on like my politics and whatnot but i am taking those lessons that i learned and i'm becoming a better person about it i'm not bribing them i'm not blackmailing them i am making a genuine appeal to their emotions and also again a kind of a logic sense that you guys wouldn't break each other up because what you equestria needs the two of you as a duo like how equestria needs these three as a trio now she does still get a shout out in that scene where the pony giving the speech he mentioned something about how some ponies are like definitely better off and like the crusaders have helped them be who they want to be and diamond tiara specifically looks at them in waves like she gets something but i think if she had delivered that speech it would have taken this from about a b tier episode i, I think i'd probably give it an a like i'll be nice enough to give it an a tier it would have made it an easy s tier episode but it's i like it i maybe it is more here like i don't i don't know i think it's fine like i like it i do like it i just don't love it and i feel like it is one of those little details that if they had changed it would have been like i like it enough to yeah i love it this is a really good one between dark and dawn let me make sure yeah that is the title between dark and dawn is a celestia luna episode where the two of them decide okay since you ponies are gonna take over we're gonna go on vacation we're gonna give you an event i think it was like a swan appreciation or some shit or like we're gonna give you a pretty low-key event to handle and manage to kind of get into the swing of things as a canterlot politician but nothing so crazy that if you fucked it up it would be like a terrible deal we're gonna go on vacation and start you know taking care of our bucket list with celestia wanting to do all the crazy shit like barrel riding down niagara falls and niagara falls zip lining uh like spelunking into crystal caves with big ass stalagmites and whatnot and luna's like dude i just i just want to chill on the beach i just want to read i want to go see the opera i have very different interests and ideas of this is not my this isn't my idea of fun was not expecting to think of the swan princess here but okay i i guess my brain decided to do that 
Um, but I mean, I guess it's also kind of a slightly swan-themed episode, so it's not completely out of nowhere. The two... Oh. Sorry, I heard hear the dogs barking. I think they're bothering Jose, poor guy. Um, Celestia and Luna also get a song, and it's... It's a lot like Trixie and Starlight's Road to Friendship song from season... Was that season 8 or season 7? I... Huh. I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> some of these later seasons, some of the episodes do kind of blend together. I'm like, I don't know which season that was in specifically. I want to say it was season eight, but I think it was anyways. I'm not really going around that rabbit hole. It's a very similar song of, we're going to go on a road trip and we're going to do it together. And it's going to be the best thing ever. And then as it goes on, like, I don't think I should be doing this with you. I love you. You're important to me. I don't think you are the right person for me to go on this adventure with. And they get into a fight at some point. They split up. Oh, there's this one scene where Luna just wants to go to a post office and she sends Celestia a postcard. And Celestia is very confused. Like, you could have just handed this to me and it would have sufficed. No, because the mail is a process, sister. It's so funny. Meanwhile, the main six are trying to do this swan thing, and they're trying to do it by themselves, ignoring the committee. He's like, we got to prove that we can do this. And Fancy Pants is the head of the committee. And bro is just, <laughs> he's like, okay, you don't want our help. Got it. <laughs> and he is just trolling them and belittling them the entire fucking way until they get the point that, look, you don't have to do everything on your own. Yes, you will be the ponies in charge, just like how Celestia and Luna are the ponies in charge. They don't do everything by themselves either. They can oversee things. They can have the final word. It is important to learn to delegate because nothing will ever get done. And sometimes there are ponies with expertise that you don't quite have. And it is okay to let them handle a situation. Did you learn that, Sparks? You know what? I think I did. Delamagation time. Uh, there's this face that twilight makes near the end of the episode where we were watching it on the youtube app like on roku and then after we, we saw it i was like okay i have to get this on my phone so i can screen cap this fucking face when she's because the sisters give her a button to push to uh you know fuck with the sun and the moon it's like hey we're on vacation we ain't fucking with the sun and the moon this is all you sparks and she's fucking it up and she has this real demented expression while she's holding the button and it was beautiful and i mean this episode here is just 90 percent of those kinds of expressions this is an s tier episode i loved it i thought this was an absolutely fan-fucking-tastic phenomenal tier episode now we move into Sorry, it's a habit to put so actually hold up. One, two, three, four, one, two. Yeah, I mean they're still about the same. We move on to Pinkie Pie's final solo episode. Or main focus of I mean, I guess it is a solo episode, because I don't think anyone else in the main six was in it. It was just her, Weird Al, and uh, other rando characters of the week. But Pinky's final episode is she gets invited to Cheese Sandwich's <laughs> Laugh Factory. And it, it has this kind of Willy Wonka feel to it. If her, I think even the invitation was like, that kind of gives me some golden ticket vibes. And uh, I'm not going to go into a whole thing about the Willy Wonka AI and how they call him Willy Wanker. And what is that? It's the, uh, no, oh, okay. Oh, okay. We were, so we finished the show last night and we were, did not watch this episode. Yes, did we watch it? No, we watched it, I think, a day or two before. But Clay sent me a meme, and I have to read it out loud because it is Willy Wonka adjacent, and it made me laugh. Like, he was crying laughing, and then he showed it to me. Oh, fuck, where is it? I have to find it. 
I'm sorry. I know I'm getting so Okay, here it is. Oompa Loompa Doopity Dare. The court finds you breached your duty of care. Oompa Loompa Doopity Disc. That's what the court calls assumption of risk. Oompa Loompa Doopity Dare. Only a partial judgment for you. Oompa Loompa Doopity Doubt. The rest of the class. Class action lawsuit is hereby slam slam thrown out. <laughs> and then it ends with this fucking picture of an Oompa Loompa wearing a judge wig, and I lost it. I'm losing it now. Oh, okay. I need to go and drink some water. We'll get to the episode. I promise. Mm. Oh. So Pinky goes to Cheese Sandwich's Laugh Factory, and like the thing in Glasgow, it was kind of disappointing for her. Because Cheese is not as, a uh, he's not as bright. His, I think even his hair was kind of a little fucked up. Where he has lost his laugh. He made this factory so he could make, he could mass produce gags for ponies across Equestria, and specific gags tailored to uh, certain ponies. There was one it showed early in the episode where a gag he did for a kid's birthday is a pinata, and the kid is banging the pinata with a stick, and then the stick breaks and is full of candy, and I was like, okay, that's actually really cool. <laughs> like, I like that one a lot. Like, if something like that happened to me of, like when I was a kid during my birthday, hell, even that happened now. If I had a fucking pinata and the thing, the stick breaks, that's fun. That's really fun. As the episode goes on, they're trying to get him to laugh. He's like, I can acknowledge when something's funny, but it just, it just doesn't hit me anymore. And what they realized is, Cheese being the kind of pony that he is, making something funny for someone else to see doesn't really work. He has to be there in person and see the person laugh. That is what brings him joy. It is not just, yeah, I made somebody happy and that makes me happy. He has to see it. He has to get that kind of reward. And Pinky knows that she's the same kind of person. And earlier in the episode, that's right, the others do appear in the episode because she talks to him in the beginning. Because at the start of the episode, she tells everyone, I feel left out because all of you guys seem to have your purpose and like your goals in life. And I don't. And I feel like I'm being left behind. Or that I'm almost kind of less important. And, excuse me. By the end of the episode, seeing how Cheese went on to big and better things, but it didn't make him happy. He is someone that has to be, you know, hooves on the ground, see, see you smile face to face. Made her realize that, yeah, like, just because I don't have a big thing that I do, or like a place that I run, that's okay. I don't need that. I just need to make sure that every pony smiles, smiles, smiles. And if I can do that, I'm living my best life. And you know what? It's a pretty good episode. I don't think, it, despite it being an episode all about humor and gags, I don't think it's particular. Like, it's pretty funny. But I'm not like, damn, this episode about comedy is hilarious. I think it's pretty funny. I, I think I would probably keep it in a B tier. I don't think... I think if I laughed more consistently or harder during the episode, I would probably give it an A. But I think it's a very strong B respect kind of episode. Then we get two, four, six, great. Actually, I don't think it's great. I, I gotta check something. That's right. It's not two, four, six, great. It's two, four, six, great. <laughs> because I, I just, the way it's spelled, I'm like, damn, is Tony the Tiger going to fucking be in this episode? Um, this episode, Celestia's School for Gifted Unicorns is going to play the Pony, the School of Friendship Buckball team, not Fluttershy, Pinky, and uh, Snails. Those three are going to be training the school's team to take on Celestia's team. Rainbow Dash wants to help coach the team, 
But Twilight says, no. Instead, I want you to teach, or excuse me, I want you to coach the cheer squad. And me, <laughs> watching an episode about someone trying to coach the cheer squad, I immediately think of Sue Sylvester from Glee. <laughs> Who, it's been a long time since I watched Glee. But from what I remember, Jane Lynch's Sue Sylvester was the best part of the show. <laughs> but unlike Sue Sylvester, who takes her cheerleading and her Cheerios very seriously, she's all about that service business. Rainbow Dash couldn't give a flying fuck. She... Does not want to be coaching the cheer team. She has no interest in cheerleading. And is like, yeah, guys, just uh, just keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to go watch the team practice. And the kids are very mad at her for not taking this job seriously. Rainbow Dash is just mad in general because she was given a job she doesn't want to do. And eventually gets to a point where she gets called out by Smolder for like, look... I heard you were going to coach the team, so I joined because I thought you were cool and awesome and 20% cooler and all that shit. But you's kind of a bitch. <laughs> like, you're... Why are you like this? You know, just because, like, you know, I don't super care about cheerleading, but my friends were interested in this, and we wanted to have a good time together. And even if you don't care, it was still something Twilight assigned for you to do. You could at least try. If you tried and we failed, then we failed. But it meant that you cared enough about us to put the effort in. It's the fact that you didn't care enough to try. That's what's disappointing. And Rainbow Dash goes, Oh, I'm an asshole. Let me fix this. So she gets the team together and super coaches them up. And the halftime show goes super well. The team still loses the game. And Rainbow Dash is like, I don't fucking care. My cheer team kicked ass. Uh, we're great. I love you guys. Blah, 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 blah. And like, that's it. Um, I, I didn't really like this episode. It's like, man... A Rainbow Dash Buckball episode that was really good and showed Rainbow Dash like actively investing in a friend of hers and even if not everything she did worked, genuinely trying to make her friend's life better. A Rainbow Dash Buckball episode where she keeps blowing off her students and I get it, this is not a position you wanted, it's still what you were given. So you need to either A, tell Twilight, like, I'm sorry, I can't do it, you need to find someone else, or step up. The fact that she does just keep blowing them off, like, it's a, I think it's in this episode where she's, like, talking to the Crusaders, like, hey, girls, you know, when you grow up, you'll understand what responsibility means. What the fuck are you talking about, Rainbow Dash? This is an episode all about how you had a responsibility and it wasn't until one of your students said, I don't really like you anymore. Like, I've lost respect for you because of how you're acting. That's, like, it was less because I have a responsibility and I gotta do this and more just, ow, my ego hurt. I guess I gotta fix it. It's, I love Rainbow Dash. I love Rainbow Dash for being the piece of shit in the group. But I feel like in the later seasons, like, there's episodes where I feel like I have seen her grow out of this. And then it just kind of happens again anyways. And I really don't enjoy those episodes. Would I say it's F tier? Because it's not bottom of the fucking barrel. I don't like it as much as Garble's half-assed redemption. I really hate that episode. I don't think this is, like, fucking dog shit, but it's a D tier. I don't care for it. I can't... I have to put it straight in there. This episode... This... A Trivial Pursuit might be the single funniest episode in Friendship is Magic's long tenure. This is episode, what, like, 211? 
Oh, wow. That, that's actually right on the money. It is. Holy shit. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't pull that out of my ass. <laughs> oh my God. Holy crap. Uh, this is episode 211. And it genuinely might be the funniest in the series. This right here might be one of the only scenes where the characters are on model. <laughs> Friendship is Magic is a show with a lot of crazy ass faces. And I think that really started with Party of One. Like there's, there's probably some like good faces before that in season one. But I feel like it was Pinky's party and that moment when her eyes just go, like, sideways. That, to me, is the moment that made people love Friendship is Magic crazy faces. And then Lesson Zero took that and ran with it. This episode is a love letter to insane Friendship is Magic faces. Twilight gets great ones. Pinky is, like... Pinky looks more like how she did in the movie. And I'm like, why does she, like, why does she, like, the way she's drawn, why does that look more like Toon Boom, Pinky? But it's in this art style, so I don't mind it. It actually kind of works. There's this one dialogue exchange between, okay, so the whole plot of the episode is it's trivia night. And Twilight has won the last two trivia nights and wants to three-peat, because no one is three-peated, and is taking it super serial, and is going full neurotic Lesson Zero, it's about time-style Twilight. She is paired up with Pinky, because the teams are randomly arranged. Applejack and Rarity, or excuse me, not Rarity, Rarity is not in this episode, and that is its only flaw. Everyone else in the main six, and even in Spike, or is in the episode. Starlight is not, but they specifically bring up that Starlight has been broken by Trivia Night, so that's why she's not there. Like, okay, that's funny enough. I like that. I wish Rarity was in here because she would have had some gold faces, and I feel like there would have been like a, there could have been some really funny line deliveries from her. But alas. But Applejack and Rainbow Dash are on different teams and are, like, actively competing and shit-talking each other as they should. There's this one scene where uh, Granny Smith is asking the questions. It's like, alright, this question, the, the category for this next question is apples. It just kind of winks at Applejack. So she reads the question. I don't remember exactly what it was, but the answer is obviously Zap Apples. So, Applejack, like, rings in to answer, and before she does, you just hear Rainbow Dash on the side. Oh, don't choke! And Applejack gets really fucking mad, walks up to her, it's like, oh, what'd you, don't choke, don't choke, I ain't gonna choke, I know my fucking apples, Rainbow Dash. Oh shit, I completely forgot what the question was! I laughed really hard at that, I'm sorry, I just said, don't choke. That got a good laugh out of me. Basically anything Twilight did or said in the episode, which was the vast majority of the episode. Like her rules lawyering people I thought was really funny. Her growing, not even frustration with Pinky, but how she's like, I am going to play the game and ignore my teammate as much as possible. And Pinky's just growing frustration with it I thought was really funny. Twilight then teams up with Sunburst who starts doing the same thing to her and she's getting super pissed. It's just a, such a fun time. This episode is amazing. I had no idea what I was going to think of this episode. I was like, okay, it's a trivia. I don't know. It might be kind of fun. I'm like, oh my goodness. This was impeccable. This was fucking special. Let's go. Uh, the summer sun set back? Yeah! Another title right, baby! So this episode is set to be the last summer sun celebration uh, of Celestia and Luna's reign. Twilight is doing all the planning, and even though she went completely off her fucking rocker just a week ago, she's completely fine. 
Is she the way she kind of says it is like, look, aside from the odd trivia night, I've kind of gotten over my neurosis. And it almost uh, this was kind of this really was the last hoorah of neurotic twilight. And it really, in a sense, feels like she got it out of her system in trivia night. And now she is ready to take shit seriously. And I kind of like that. She gives her friends a list of things to do. And the lists are all pretty short. And Discord's like, I want something. Why don't you give me? And she just kind of gives them this look and writes something down. And in my brain, I just, I could just see her writing, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Which is essentially what she tells them to do. It's like, what did you tell Discord to do? Keep Discord from doing anything discord -y. <laughs> But, um, while this is going on, Team Rocket is in the episode. I, what were they specifically trying to, oh, that's right. Because I think they were trying to figure out how to use the bell. And what they decided to do is, let's go to the Canterlot archives and see if we can find a book on how to do anything with the bell. We have to sneak in and get through security. When they get to the archives, I'll talk about some of the shit they have to do to get there. But when they get to the archives, the part that cracks me up is the book they need is locked up. And Cozy Glow finds it, can't undo the chains. So she picks up another book that has a key on the cover and uses it and like beats the shit out of a lock with the book key and that opens it like that. The visual thing, it's like, yo, it's funny enough that just beating the shit out of it worked. But the fact that, that book had a key on it, I was like, that's really funny. I really appreciated that. But what these three do is they start causing distrust amongst the other races. Tyrik starts stealing magic from the Earth Ponies, and then afterwards just takes a fucking pie, <laughs> which made me laugh pretty hard. It's like, I'm gonna take all your magic. Also, I'm fucking hungry. <laughs> Cozy Glow volunteers to help the Pegasi with the weather, and then starts fucking with the weather and just making chaotic shit happen. Chrysalis turns into the unicorn, like her, I don't remember what she called it. But the photographer one from the Mean Six. And talks to the unicorns are supposed to work the fireworks show. And it's like, hey, unicorns are better than this. We as a race are better than this. I mean, come on. And I found that really interesting. That's like, how did you uh, beat up the, like, how'd you weaken the Earth Ponies resolve? I just stole their fucking essence. What'd you do with the Pegasi? I just threw their shit out of whack and the guy kind of had a panic attack. What did you do to the unicorns? I told them they were the master race and they instantly believed me. Like, ha, huh, that... That's really interesting. And I don't know if I like the implications of this. But the Remain 5 and Discord, it's, I think it's supposed to be the Remain 5. I don't think Discord did a whole lot. Um, and Spike. Spike definitely helped too. They are trying to fix these problems without letting Twilight know because they don't want Twilight to start Twilighting about it. Eventually, she finds out what happened and they're able to get the thing solved. The celebration goes off. Twilight says, this is the last Summer Sun celebration. Because that's the thing. Celestia and Luna say, we want to retire the holiday. This commemorated me defeating Nightmare Moon and Luna rejoining me. It's a holiday about us. If we are stepping down, there's kind of not a point to it anymore. And we'd also rather not commemorate, you know, the whole Nightmare Moon thing. So which Twilight says, bet. Summer Sun celebration, no longer a thing. Instead, I'm making a new holiday on the same day just to honor the two of them and everything they've done for a question. I don't remember what she called it. It was just like the Feast of the Two Sisters, something like that. And uh, between the ponies, they're all like, okay, we, we're not going to start a race war, which is a good thing. And there's a new holiday. And Team Rocket over here is like, okay, so we got the book. We can learn how to use the bell. It was also not that hard to turn these ponies against each other. Huh. Maybe the three of us should just put a pin in that for later. 
So I like this episode quite a bit. It does further the main plot of the season, as we'll see here, and we saw here, and uh, the premiere. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the continuity. I love just any scene with the three of them. Whether it's one of them doing something or them as a group, I think they're gold. I think Discord is fun in this episode. Mm -hmm. I like seeing, even though there's an occasional relapse, I do like seeing Twilight grow. And I will say, it's. I know I was talking about this, like how this is a clear relapse, at least for me, for Rainbow Dash, and I really dislike it. And this is a relapse for Twilight, and I don't mind it. It's because this episode is funny. This one to me, it's not per it's not funny and it's not particularly interesting. I just feel like the character, I think she should be written better than this. And if you're gonna sacrifice the integrity of her character, do something really interesting or really fun. I can take, I, I feel like there's a sliding scale between, okay, like... Especially in Friendship is Magic, I feel like a character's growth, for better or for worse, is kind of fluid. But if an episode is funny enough, or emotional enough, or genuinely just fun enough in another way, I can kind of take it. Look at almost any episode with Starlight Glimmer. She is a better person who has learned all about friendship. Also, she's a fucking nutcase. <laughs> Oh, she's a fucking... Actually, I mean, she's not that much of a nut... No, no, she has Phyllis. She's, she's fucking crazy. <laughs> and that's what makes her great. Anyways, uh, Summer Sun Setback. This is an A-tier episode for sure. I, I don't think I would put it up here. Especially as an episode with Team Rocket. I don't like it nearly as much as Frenemies. Like, Frenemies clears this so strongly... That this is an A tier, but I think it's a very strong A tier episode. She talks to Angel. Says she talks to Angel. Says they all know her name. Do, 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 do. So, in this episode, Fluttershy and Angel are fighting. Angel is mad at Fluttershy because Fluttershy is spending all her time at the sanctuary and not paying attention to him and not pampering him the way he wants. And Fluttershy is mad at Angel because Angel keeps disrupting her work because he needs this attention. And she's like, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. I've got other shit I need to do. Zakora sees the two of them feuding and they, they go to couples therapy? Which was interesting. <laughs> like, I... Okay. But they go to couples therapy, and what Zakora prescribes is, okay, uh, I'm not going to tell you what this does, but drink this potion together. It, it'll switch your bodies, and you can understand each other better, and blah, 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 blah. So, they do. Angel is in Fluttershy's body, so we get to hear Angel talk, and... It's kind of underwhelming. Like, given how much of a piece of shit that Angel is, a lot of his dialogue is... I mean, it's it does not stuff Fluttershy would say. Like, he's definitely a bit more mean. But it's not like, oh my goodness. What an asshole. Like, dude, he's so funny. Like, it's, it's okay, I think. Fluttershy ends up in Angel's body and... She can't talk and no one can understand her because no one speaks bunny. Excuse me, except for Angel and Fluttershy's body. So Angel goes to the sanctuary as Fluttershy to help with the chores. Fluttershy as Angel goes to see Zakora. Fluttershy has a hard time being a bunny and that being a bunny is super tough. Because, you know, the world is so much bigger, and no one understands you, and everything wants to eat you, and kill you, and blah blah blah. Angel learns that Fluttershy's job is hard, because there's a lot of animals at the sanctuary, and there's a lot of different things that they all need. There's also this subplot about a python named Anton, who wants to eat a baby elephant. And at one point, 
eats the baby elephant, and there's just this baby elephant sigh. <laughs> Like, just fucking baby elephant shape inside Anton's gut. And then they have to get the elephant out of him. And it gets, that part is really fun. It's like, yeah, I mean, he wanted her over for dinner. Not, like, over for dinner. Not over for dinner. He wants her for dinner. Oh, I fucked up. Like, it, it, there are some fun moments. And then after they've realized, uh... Okay, so here's the problem I have with the episode, though. Like, A, while it can be funny, I feel like finally getting to hear Angel talk, like I said, like, it, it's not nearly as funny or nearly as mean as I guess I was kind of hoping for this character. Like, compared to getting to hear Gummy talk in Slice of Life and how it's some of the funniest shit in the entire show, like, th this was all right. The real problem I have is I feel like Fluttershy is very justified. Fluttershy has a lot of shit to do and the it seems like she's like, I want to make time for Angel. I make time for him when I can. It's just hard to do with my schedule. The problem is Angel is a massive fucking brat who is so used to monopolizing her attention that he can't deal with it. And he makes it everyone's problem. Which means it's also Fluttershy's problem, and he's just making things worse. The lesson Fluttershy learns is, man, it's really hard being a bunny, because the world is so big, and everything hates you, and no one can understand you. I get it now. Okay, the no one can understand you thing, and like, you, there's only one person he can communicate with, I mean, I get it. I don't know why he can't communicate with other animals because they seem to be able to communicate with each other just fine. But sure. Fluttershy, you empathizing with Angel is because you went into the Everfree Forest and that made you go, oh my god, being a rabbit is hard. You as a full-grown pony have trouble with the Everfree Forest. <laughs> like, how often does Angel do that? Like, it, to me, the reason it doesn't work from that perspective is what Angel is learning is this is a normal day in Fluttershy's life, and now that I'm in her hooves, I understand how busy she is. If Fluttershy was going through just a normal day in Angel's life, I, there's maybe something she could learn, but no, she makes it an abnormal day, and then is like, oh man... By doing things by yourself that you would never do by yourself, I'm learning how dangerous it is to be you. Yeah, no shit. Like, it's, I think it's pretty dumb and it kind of misses the mark. Uh, it's not like a, it's not around here. Like, no, no, no. I don't even think I could put it here because I don't think I'm neutral because I do like it. I know I've been, like, kind of shitting on it, but, like, I, I have a soft spot for it because I like the idea. I do think there are some funny jokes. It doesn't work as a whole for me, but I think it's all right. I think I do like this episode more than this one. So I'm gonna... I'm gonna do that. Yeah. Do I want to put this one up here? I don't think I like this one quite as much as some of these, though. Hmm. No, I think I will do it. I think I'll keep it like that. Oh boy. Dragon dropped. This is Rarity's last episode. And it's also Spike's last episode. And there's... Well, I mean, Spike has a lot of screen time here. It's kind of funny to me that the last episode of Friendship is Magic, before the climax... And the epilogue of the whole Ding Dang series is a Discord Spike Big Macintosh episode. <laughs> it's a Guys Night episode. And I, I think that's kind of neat, but also... Fucking really? That feels like such an odd pick. I mean, I'm not complaining, but... Huh. That's kind of interesting. Hmm. 
water to drink. The plot of this episode... Rarity's like, hey, Spike, I'm going to go get some gems. You want to come with? And Spike goes, eh, I got plans. Rarity, who is used to Spike, you know, when she says jump, he says how high, is shocked to hear that he would rather do literally anything, not literally anything else, but the fact that he would actually want to do something else besides hang out with her. She is shocked. She is devastated. She is heartbroken. She thinks that she did something to piss Spike off, doesn't know what it is, but needs to apologize. Which does lead to this really funny line that it kind of said a couple times. It's like the sentiment is, is, I have to apologize. What for? Honestly, who cares what for? <laughs> I don't remember exactly what the line is, but it is something that's like, oh, I don't see why that matters. I laughed really hard at that. But it turns out, no, Spike isn't mad at Rarity. He's just met someone. It's Gabby, the the cutie of our Crusaders griffin friend. She, the two of them have been pen pals for quite a while. And she comes by to visit pretty often. And does a lot of mail deliveries and does the rounds. And Spike hangs out with her. And they share ice cream. And, like, she'll give him the cherry from his food while Lyra and Bon Bon are sharing a milkshake in the back. Yeah, I saw that shit. That was adorable. And Rarity is seeing this and going, what, what the fuck? That's my Spike. That's my little stooge. She... Hussy, she can't steal him from me. So she tries to win Spike back. By uh, taking him to a gem cave. He's like, but I got plants with Gabby. And Gabby's like, no, that sounds way better. You go do that. Then Rarity goes the next day like, I've got tickets to a convention. A Power Ponies convention. I gotta go. I can't go. I want to hang out with Gabby. And I'm like, no, no, it's okay. Then the next day, Spike is really exhausted from the convention. So he calls Gabby. He's like, Gabby, I can't go out today. I'm super tired. And Rarity's like, okay, Spike, I know you said you were tired, and I thought I was tired, but why don't we play Ogres and Oubliettes together? And Spike's like, okay, I've, I've, I might be tired, but I've always got energy for O and O. I'm like, I, I kind of get that. You know, there's just those things where you're like, I'm super tired, I don't want to do anything today. But there are those specific things that if someone's like, hey, man... Do you want to do this? Your energy is back and you're good for it. And Gabby wanted to go see Spike and just kind of see how he's doing. And then he, she catches him playing O and O with Rarity. And she's like, you lied to me, you son of a bitch. And she gets really bad and heartbroken. And Rarity is all proud of herself because she can now hang out with Spike however she wants. And Spike is super sad. And then she apologizes to Gabby for basically stealing spike back so let me talk about this episode you know the thing i've been doing for the last couple minutes i w i watched all of season nine with clay he did not like this episode he was not getting into it and i loved it because i thought this episode was fucking fascinating to me there are three ways you can interpret rarity. I mean, maybe there's more that I just haven't thought of. But, like, the way that I see it, I can see three interpretations for her. Number one is what the episode is, like, directly trying to say. Which is, Rarity and Spike have been friends for a very long time. And Rarity is used to Spike's company. She genuinely appreciates what he does for her. In addition to just appreciating his presence and his company and him as a person. And now that Spike has other friends and she can't monopolize his time, it's, it's making her jealous. Not romantic jealous, but it is making her a bit jealous. And she's getting a bit too possessive and she needs to learn that, hey, you are not his only friend. There are times when you want to do something 
And he just has other shit to do that day. And it's totally fine. You don't have to be possessive. You don't have to try and throw a wrench in his relationships. It's okay for you both to be your own people and have other interests. And that's okay. Then there's the other two ways to look at the episode. There's a very unflattering way of looking at Rarity. And another way that's, I mean, I don't know if I'd say it's flattering per se, but the, I think kind of the more obvious interpretation. The less flattering way is that Rarity just likes having Spike as a minion. And that, because a lot of what it is, is not just, yeah, you know, I'm so used to having Spike around and the fact that he goes to the spa with me and or that we have tea together. It's all errands. When I go into the cave, I know exactly where Spike is standing. He knows exactly which kind of basket to grab. When I'm going out shopping for fabric, Spike has a good eye for that. He also holds all the fabric. When I'm going to buy gemstones, he can let me know which are the best gemstones. He's the one that holds my fucking pincushion. I remember in one previous episode, I think Spike was literally her pincushion. It comes across pretty easily in the episode, unfortunately. That it's not that I miss him, I miss what he provides. And he provides me with a lot. So, uh, Gabby, that's my little stooge. Go get your own. Which is a very unflattering way to look at Rarity. It's very cynical and very mean-spirited. But I feel like it's very much there in the text. The other way, which I feel like it's... Even if it's not what the episode is directly saying, I feel like it's kind of the intended way. Because of course the last episode with Rarity and Spike is a Rarity Spike episode. Although it is kind of disappointing that there's no Rarity Applejack episode this season because those are genuinely some of the funniest even if the episode, like, Apple, like, Honest Apple isn't the best, but it's still funny and a good time, and it, it, actually, I'm maybe underselling it, but it's a really good time. It's stupid, but it's so funny. Sorry, I was about to say something, I was ready, and then my brain fucking stopped, so I'm gonna get some water, and hopefully I can get uh, my brain going again. Mm. Okay. The way this episode feels. Rarity wants to hang out with her friend Spike, who she does not see as a romantic interest. Spike now has a girlfriend. He has someone that he really likes, who he likes spending time with, who gives him who excuse me, who matches his energy and his vibes. Rarity sees that the guy who liked her and was obsessed with her and was simping over her is now in a happy, healthy relationship. And it makes her miss him. However you want to interpret that. Because you could see it as, yeah, he's still my little minion, go get your own, I... I need that. Or maybe she just wants him, not because she has feelings for him and not because it's her minion, but because it feeds her ego. Or you could see it as she's realizing that she actually does have feelings for him. And she just didn't realize it. But now that she realizes that, oh my God, I could lose him. And I maybe already did. She's now working double and triple time to get him back. Not only trying to bribe him back with these exorbitant gifts, 
but is also trying to monopolize his time. And so, hey, not only are you going to be spending time with me, and I can try to get you back into liking me and spending time with me, but you won't be spending time with your girl. This goes on for a couple days. And then she not only convinces Spike to not hang out with his girlfriend, but goes over to his house that same day so they can hang out together. Now, it is not that she invited Gabby over to be like, hey, look, your boyfriend is hanging out with his ex or like the girl that you know he really liked. Mm -hmm. But that is what Gabby sees. Like, oh my God, my boyfriend blew me off and lied to me, which Spike didn't lie, but to her perspective, it's he blew me off and lied to me to hang out with another girl that I know he likes. What an asshole. And she breaks up with him. And Spike, who was not doing anything duplicitous, is devastated because he genuinely really liked this girl and was in a happy, healthy relationship. And Rarity ruined it. And for her, it's now things can go back to the way they were. Again, whether that's I just have my friend or it's I've got my ego is stroked. I have my minion or if it is like, no, I do really like him. And I'm noticing that now I can foster that relationship. And then she sees just how heartbroken he is like, okay, I have to fix this. So she does a grand gesture and apology to Gabby for stealing Spikey Wikey back so they can become a couple again and they do and i guess everything is gucci and that's their last episode and i find it really interesting i, I don't it's not an s tier episode for me but i do like it quite a bit i i i enjoyed my time with it a lot <sighs> a horse shoein Oh, boy. So Twilight, because she is going to be the ruler of the country, is not going to be head mayor of the school. That is going to go to Starlight, which I actually believe was talked about here. I just kind of forgot to mention that. And now it's... It's going to be happening soon, so they're kind of starting to prepare for, I don't know if I really, yeah, Twilight, or Starlight's promotion. I was like, succession doesn't sound quite right, because I don't think it's granted for that. Twilight, or Starlight's promotion. So Starlight gets the idea that, and it's specifically because she talks to Trixie. Trixie's like, yeah, but I mean, Twilight runs the school, but she doesn't do it by herself. Twilight never does anything by herself. She always has her friends. And Trixie goes, or Starlight goes, oh, that gave me a really good idea. I should hire a vice principal to help me and assist me run the school. That's a great idea, Trix. Thank you. She talks to Twilight. Twilight's like, yeah, that's a great idea. If that's what you want to do, Starlight, be my fucking guest. Go glim glam it up. Then Trixie goes, okay, Starlight, I heard everything and I accept. Accept what? The position. I mean, you just talked to me about um, how, what you should do, thanked me for giving you the idea, and then went to Twilight and said, you want to hire a vice principal, a vice head mayor, and uh, you want to run it with a friend. Like, I mean, let's be honest. You're doing it for me. And what she keeps doing, she keeps saying, like, I get it. You have to go through a whole procedure. Wink. <laughs> she like, wink, and then says, like, why, why are you saying wink? Oh, I'm not. Wink. And Starlight is very confused, but also, like, she under, she can pick up what Trixie's putting down as, like, oh, God. Oh, no. This is not at all what I'm trying to do. Um... How do I break the news to her? Okay. New strategy. I don't. <laughs> and I... 
So then she gets her candidates for vice principal. You have Spoiled Rich, Dr. Hooves, Octavia, Big Macintosh, and Trixie. So she gives them a series of tests. First is teaching lessons, like being a substitute. And Spoiled Rich gets off there. Trixie just takes a nap with her students and Starlight's like, That was not a good look. But I mean... Maybe, maybe she could actually be a good teacher one day with some help. Then it's student-teacher conferences and Big Macintosh being the great communicator that he is. is like, I, I gotta drop out after this, I'm sorry. And Trixie is talking to Grandpa Gruff about Gallus, who's like, I don't want to fucking be here. I don't give a shit about this kid. He's not my kid. And Gallus is just really upset and I felt super bad for him. And Trixie basically tells Grandpa Gruff to go fuck himself. Which, in the context, is honestly not unjustified. It's When Starlight is saying to her, it's like, Trixie, you really can't talk to a parent like that. I get it and it makes sense. Also, though, she is standing up for one of her students, and I do respect her a lot for that. And it is something that Starlight doesn't know. It's like, I I like that you stood up for my student. That's good. Maybe more tact, but... Eh. After that, it's a field trip where Dr. Hooves takes the students to his lab, and they all get super bored. And he's like, I'm working on a time travel device. Sit in this chair. Ha! Huh, you've sat in the chair for five seconds and you're now five seconds into the future. And I I turn to Clay laughing as a like, Clay, that is the time oven from Homestuck. Because the time oven is my single favorite thing from Homestuck. He sits in this this oven is a time machine. And you anyone who sits in the oven travels into the future at the rate of one second per second. <laughs> I'm sorry, I fucking love the time of it. So Dr. Hooves is out and Trixie, instead of going somewhere, brings a place to them and she takes Froggy Bottom Bog, brings it into the school, at least partially, and they get attacked by Flash Bees. So she put the students very much in danger. And I was like, it's like, yeah, this feels like some shit that would happen at Owl House. And it would be great and encouraged. But here it's a bad thing to put the students in danger. Starlight goes off on Trixie, calls her. Basically, you're like, you are just a stupid, incompetent piece of shit who makes my life worse. And I hate you so much right now. And Trixie is... Obviously very hurt by Starlight's words, and Starlight's like, I... I mean, I know why I said it, but it doesn't mean I had to say it. Twilight comes in, they have a pep talk. Starlight goes, apologizes to Trixie, tells her that Octavia was the last candidate standing because Octavia did everything perfectly, and then said, eh, I actually don't think I want to do it anymore, it's going to get in the way of my music career. Like, oh, it... well, that was something you were kind of building up, and I guess we're not going to do, okay. So Starlight goes, Trixie, first off, I am sorry, and I love you. Second, you should not be vice principal. <laughs> and third, I should have told you that at the start. It's not that I was trying to string you along. It's just I genuinely didn't know how I should tell you that you weren't gonna get the job and that you were a bad fit for it without being an asshole. And unfortunately, I was an asshole anyways, and I'm sorry. But, even though I don't think you should be vice principal, I think you should take my old job of being the student counselor because you are very good at giving advice. Sunburst is going to be my vice principal, and I think he's going to kill it in that. You are going to kill it as the guidance counselor. And I'm going to get to run the school with my two best friends. Bet. Bet. 
Also throughout the episode, Starlight has this plant that sits on her desk named Phyllis that she talks to. <laughs> and I just thought it was consistently really funny. And when Trixie gets the new job and goes to the office, she's like, okay, first thing is the plant has got to go. It just screams. Death. I don't know why I made her sound like a valley girl, but man, she's almost a valley girl. Like, not quite, but it's it's almost, like, there's a hint of it in there. It's like, this has got to go. And then just puts it in the trap. <laughs> and then the episode just ends with Starlight looking just mortified and Phyllis! <laughs> <laughs> and I just cut to black. This is an amazing episode. I fucking love it. Daring Doubts. Yes, that is the title of the episode. It's one of... A lot of the Daring Do titles past Read em and Weep just kind of get muddled. Or I was like, okay, there's Daring don't there's daring done there's daring doubt and they all sound very similar and the plot of daring doubt and daring done are also very similar of like hey there's a someone spreading rumors about daring do being a real person and like a terrible fucking piece of shit and in one of them it's caballeron spreading rumors and in the other one, it's Caballeron spreading rumors, but this time he put it in a book. Um, I've made no secret that I don't really like Daring Do episodes. With a couple exceptions. Read em and Weep is one of my favorite episodes. I hope it makes it to the top 26, but I actually took stock of that earlier today, by the way. In between recording these two videos, because that, that was at, what, like, 8 in the morning, and now it's almost 8 at night? <laughs> and it's like, okay, what are all the episodes? I gave, like, an S tier, a double S tier, or it's an A tier episode that I am really keen on, and I want to at least, like, give it a contender. I, I want to put it in contention. I think I counted 85. And that's including these three as one. Or excuse me, I think it was 84, including this as part of this. Otherwise, it'd be 85. I'm like, huh. I'm gonna have to cut, like, 60 episodes from my top 26. So there is going to be a lot of episodes that I fucking adore that are not gonna make that list. That is crazy to think about. I hope Read Him and Weep does, because it's an episode that I genuinely love. Stranger Than Fan Fiction is the other one. I really like that episode. And because I think... Bleh, I think the reason that one really gets a pass from me is because it's about the nature of fandom rather than let's go on an adventure with a real person writing about their real ass adventures as if it were fiction. And I think that's why I don't like Daring Do episodes. Because when I say it out loud, like, this sounds really stupid, it makes no sense. What the fuck do you mean no one knows about that? I, mean, I think the, the problem is the illusion is broken the moment Caballeron was introduced. Because if it was literally just, I am writing a book series about someone who goes on these fun adventures, finds these artifacts... And is fighting a... What the fuck is Aoizodol? I don't know. I'm going to Google that. I don't know if Aoizodol is like the actual name of like some Mayan creature. Or if it's... Aoizodol is just his name and like he is a very specific creature. Hold up. Aoizodol. Oh, there was the name of an Aztec ruler. That's pretty cool. Oh no, so it is a mythical animal. That uh, too. The Aoizodol is a legendary creature in Aztec mythology. Uh, the creature was taken as an emblem by the ruler of the same name. The Aoizodol is most likely a water opossum 
which possesses dexterous hands, quote, like a raccoon's or a monkey's ankle. I mean, I'm quoting all this. This is just Wikipedia. As well as a prehensile tail, waterproof marble, black and gray fur, and small pointed ears. Okay, so that's what, he's an owie's ogle. Got it. If it was just this, I'm writing a series about an adventurer and her battle against this mythical creature that is doing crazy shit. And it's real, but no one really know like no one really knows about it because Owie Zoda, like, who the fuck is He's just like lives in the jungle and shit. No one he is not going to interact with anybody. I could buy that. As soon as you introduce Caballeron, someone who is wants to be wealthy and is a competing adventurer who knows about these books because he went to a fucking convention so he knows that these books exist. Yeah, why the fuck does he not just write his own version of the story like he does here? How is A.K. Yearling able to maintain this facade? When she interacts with a lot, like she goes to towns and interacts with people. Oh yeah, you know, my uh, my books just don't get published in that part of the country. I mean, people travel. I think word of mouth. Like, is, is, have they literally never heard of your books and thought, hey, this is fucking weird? Or I don't know, the fact that in one of your books, you put Rainbow Dash in the book and put her on the front cover and people know who the fuck Rainbow Dash is because she's helped save Equestria several times by that point this is dumb and it doesn't make any sense and I know I'm talking about the episodes as a whole and not this one specifically but I feel like it's important to say up front I like the idea the I do fuck I like the idea of the daring do books and Rainbow Dash reading a story about a pony that reminds her of herself and thinking this is the coolest shit I don't really like the idea of her being real with all that said this episode, like I was saying, feels like a retread of the last one. Of someone is trying to sully Daring Do's name and gasp. It's the same motherfucker who did it last time. And also, maybe he's not entirely wrong. He's definitely telling his side of the story. And maybe his side of the story is justified, but he's also an asshole Who's tried to do this before and... Uh... I was about to say something, I completely forgot what it was. Oh yeah, and the Owie Zodal is there because he wasn't in the last couple Daring Do adventures. And like, I... This dude's like one of the best parts of it because that's enough... I don't like Caballeron because Caballeron is boring. He's just a dude who wants money. Owie Zodal is this weird opossum with a prehensile tail and like fucking monkey hands. Like... Give me more of this thing. I want to see him. He's a fucking Bond villain. It's like the way he talks and does shit. And then we finally get to see him. And he's like, actually, I've been good all along. And you guys have just been stealing my shit. By the way, I think we're going to completely ignore the, f the part where I said I was going to curse the land with like a hundred years of sweltering, scorching heat. Or... Anytime I've literally tried to murder Daring Do by putting her in a death trap rather than just talking to her and telling her, hey, can you not steal my shit? I'm the good guy. I'm the victim here. And that's why I've chosen violence every single time. It feels like this where, hey, we have kind of a recurring villain I guess two with Caballeron and Owie Zodal. Let's try to get a resolution with them real quick. And I don't feel like, I know that was something I was talking about last season in the washouts and how you could have had a really good resolution with lightning dust. 
I think that could have happened, and I think it should have happened, because I think this is a character who was done dirty, and there's room for a resolution here. With Aoi Zotal and Caballeron, it's... I mean, we got one, and like with Garble, it feels so unearned, and just like, yeah, um... Here you go, we we made him okay. It, it, I just don't think it worked like at all i mean the fluttershy hanging out with caballeron and his jackie chan adventures-esque droogs was kind of fun but it wasn't great and you know some of the adventure stuff was pretty fun but i wish i liked the daring do episodes man i just don't i just daring don't and i'm daring done <laughs> I daring doubt that this was a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah. This is the last Rainbow Dash episode and the last Fluttershy episode. This is Fluttershy's last episode. And given that it's all about Fluttershy and Angel, I think it really works. I really wish this would have been Rainbow Dash's last episode. She would have ended on such a good note. And then it... It's a little worse. To be fair, Rainbow Dash is not the problem here. Like, she is here, but it's... Man. Man. At least these three end on a good note. I actually liked this episode quite a bit. Growing up is hard to do. This is an episode about the Crusaders wanting to go to a fair, but their big sisters are too busy and can't take them. And they're also told, hey, um... You guys are literally children, so we don't want you going by yourself. Whatever you do, please don't go by yourself. So, Twilight is studying this flower from Beauty and the Beast. He was like, I saw it, and I was like, okay, it's a wilting flower with red petals that's encased in glass. Okay, this is the fucking rose from Beauty and the Beast. This is As someone who adores Beauty and the Beast, this is pretty neat. What this flower does is it grants wishes. And the Crusader's like, man, I wish we could be big. I wish we could be adults now. I wish we could be the size of our sisters. And the flower says, cool, um, I'm just gonna count that as one. So, uh, you're all getting this one wish granted. So then they age up and we get to see adult Crusader designs. I'm like, I actually like these quite a bit. Poor Scootaloo's wings are still super tiny and she can't fly. Like, damn, that's heartbreaking. So the three of them like, hey, we're adults now. We can do whatever the fuck we want. Let's go to the fair. So they go to the fair and they get... Okay, so something I forgot to talk about last season? Maybe it was season seven? Because I can't remember. I think it was last season. It was the Kieran episode. I forgot to mention the fucking dude that works at the train station. He's like, <laughs> You've reached the end of the line. <laughs> like, <laughs> just talking in the most cryptic, threatening shit with his maniacal laughter and evil face. I forgot to bring him up, but he was so funny. He's one of like, the Kieran episode is so good, and he is like one of the best parts in it. He shows up here and he like he's doing the same thing and he's like, ah, uh, I know if you were little kids, uh, you might get lost in there and be dangerous. <laughs> but you guys are adults, I'm sure it'll be totally fine. Sorry about my throat, yo. It's like ah, it's all fucked up. <laughs> I was laughing my ass off. Like he shows up and I hear him talk and I just start laughing. And I can see Clay beside me is kind of really confused. I had to explain. It was like, no, this crazy asshole was in a previous episode and it was gold. And I'm so happy to see him again. So the Crusaders get lost. Oh, by the way, when they're on the train, they have a song about how, like, they're big now and everything is cool. And, like, I actually liked it quite a bit. Oh, I need some water. Dry ass throat. I got a bad case of dat, dry ass throat. So, they meet some kids who are having an argument because they have a pet 
One wants to bring the pet to the fair. The other's like, we shouldn't because he's very skittish and doesn't like uh, know a lot of people. Hey, adults, big people, what do you think we should do? Oh, we're big. We can make decisions. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Fucking bring the dude because we want to go to the fair and we don't know the way. We can follow you guys. So they follow him, have a good time at the fair, and Floofy the pet, who I described as a tinky winky dog, <laughs> um, goes full Taz and becomes a giant tornado and sucks up a pony that looks like Dorothy Gale, and I definitely got a laugh out of the Wizard of Oz joke. Um, they're able to eventually calm the thing down and... Twilight and Fluttershy show, like, Fluttershy calms down the animal. Twilight's like, yeah, as, um, when you three were gone and I saw that there was a petal missing, it, I kind of assumed exactly what happened and here we are. So, uh, wish yourselves back to normal and they wish themselves back to normal and they talk about the beauty of growing up and everything and I liked this episode a lot. But I put it up here. I don't think it's an S tier episode. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a ton of fun. It's not on the level of these. I mean, if I'm being honest, I'm not even sure if Sparkle 7 is. I'm putting it up here out of respect. Like, I did have a really good time with it, don't get me wrong. It maybe is more of an A tier episode. But I'm going to keep it up there. And then we get our penultimate, but not technically, you know, final episode, penultimate episode, anti-penultimate episode, if you count all these as one. This is the penultimate episode of Friendship is Magic. The last Ranbob whatever episode before all the craziness. And like I said, it's a guy's night episode. The Big Mac Questions. Where it's kind of like Saddle Row. Where the character, a lot of the characters are kind of giving interviews. I actually have no idea who's interviewing them. Because in Saddle Row, they made it clear like what the, um, what the framing device is. Here they're just kind of breaking the fourth wall. And now I'm thinking about it. I'm like, oh, that was, that is weird. I thought we were going to get, like, a full framing device with that. But I still think it's fun. Big Macintosh wants to propose to Sugar Bill. And he's got this plan where he's going to put all these apples around town with little hints and clues. It's going to lead her up to Sweet Apple Acres. Where he is going to sit with a replica of the shelf he made when he first asked her out. And will then ask her to marry him. Sugar Bill is planning on uh, proposing to Big Macintosh. And she is having Mrs. Cake make, it was like 22 desserts. And each dessert is going to have a slip of paper with a word on it. And they are all going to spell out, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was like, you know, will you marry me? All you have to say is, yup. It was something like that. And Big Mac has spike and discord helping out sugar bell has mrs cake and the crusaders hanging out and everything goes to shit also lyra and bonbon bon mutually propose to each other in the background and you know that meme of charlie of you know, uh, penguin zero to the ooh baby that's what i've been waiting for yeah like yeah that's what i've been waiting for let's go it took nine seasons 200 plus episodes lyra and bonbon bon, it's happening baby <laughs> and again that's one of those things where Watching the show without any fandom context, it's like, oh, okay, I guess that's kind of neat. But as someone who was part of the fandom, you know, all the memes, all the background character personalities, like, yeah, that's, that's what it's all about. That's fucking amazing. So Discord, being himself, can't just, like, okay, I can't just put these apples wherever. And I mean, this, this, this poetry is shitty, Big Mac. I'm gonna have some fun. So the apples become sentient and just start spouting their lines. And like, he's like, all right, just go tell them to her. 
and they don't just go to Sugar Bell, they just kind of spout it to anyone, so you get these little, like, and these little gibber jabber apples just spouting shit and causing chaos, and it's really funny. And then they start fusing together into this giant apple abomination. Sugar Bell! I love you! Marry me! <laughs> it's so funny! <laughs> and after the thing is taken care of, because Discord just snaps his fingers. Oh. You're trying to propose to me. I'm trying to do that to you. And they end up going to the apple pear tree that the, his parents planted. And they talk about how... You know, we, we just went through some weird shit, but I mean, it's not even close to the shit your parents went through. So it's not like, it's like, oh man, we should break up because the proposal was bad. Like, I still love you. You still love me. It's for good. Let's get married. And then they get married and like the Apple family is there and Discord is there and Spike is there. And if you've read the comics, you know, Fleetfoot is crying so <laughs> Uh, I don't think I'm going to reread the comics. Just because there's so many. I mean, I say as I watched 222 episodes. But, boy, that's a lot of extra shit. But I remember really liking the comics quite a bit. And on uh, Sugar Bell's side, you've got Double Diamond and Party Favor and Night Glider. And not a starlight glimmer in sight. And... I, I don't know. It was one of those things, like, I, I'm not like, man, that's so mean and fucked up. I'm like, no, but I find that really interesting. She was close to the other three, and it seems like they kept in contact. And even though they invited Starlight to go back to the village, I don't know if they ever really made up or rekindled. And I'm going to be honest, I really feel like that was a missed opportunity. I know when to wear him back again, she goes to the village and it's super awkward. And by the end, it's like, oh, okay, I guess we're good. But actually, like, that should have been an episode. Starlight goes back. Like, that should have been. Like, if you're going to say that she is graduated, has nothing left to learn, that really should have just been an episode. Starlight has to go back. Meet the ponies that she manipulated. And she has to earn their forgiveness. And either it's really hard to earn their forgiveness, but she does when they see how much she's changed, or it's easy to earn their forgiveness. And it scares her how easy it is because she still doesn't forgive herself. I really feel like, I mean, there might be other things I could think of as like, this is kind of a missed opportunity. It's like, how did we not get this as an episode? To me, off the top of my head, the two, three biggest missed opportunities in the show. Number one, Diamond Tiara not speaking in the second half of the show. And just not delivering the speech here. I feel like that would have at least like kind of made it all right for me. Two... Not doing enough with Lightning Dust, and I really feel like if you would tweet the washouts, it could have been one of my favorite episodes. And three, not giving a proper Starlight Glimmer has to fix the relationships with the ponies of Aqualia. But anyways. Uh, they get married. The, the, like I said, the Apple family is there. I think Grandpair was there. I don't think the Pies were invited, despite being family but anyways it is kind of weird that in this whole episode about how big macintosh is getting married and is trying to propose and everything applejack is not involved in it at all she shows up at the very end but doesn't even have a line not even like a, i'm so proud of you like you know mom and dad would be so proud of you or anything like that i i mean that's i think that's a missed opportunity but you know maybe not as it doesn't bother me as much as those others but this is a really good episode like i said Season 9 isn't going to have as many S-tier episodes, but there's a lot of A-tier. There's just a lot of really good episodes. And what do you know? Despite having some really great episodes, 
None of them are in the double S tier. Ha! I fucking wonder why. I'll tell ya what. I'm gonna stop this here. I'm gonna go drink the shit out of this water. I'm probably gonna go grab some ice cream because I am addicted to ice cream and milkshakes. And then I'm gonna come back and I will talk about the series finale. Episode 220, 221, and episode 222. Wait a second. Wait a second. The last problem is episode 221. Wait, what the hell? Wait, I thought it was 222. Am I insane? Wait, what the fuck? No! No, I'm wrong! Wait. Oh, hold on a second. I think this is fucked because I think this, what I'm looking at, because it has Sparkle 7 is 199 instead of 200. I don't think this is, in is including best gift ever. Which means if that's the case, when I, I think I said this was 211 earlier, while well, it said that on Wikipedia, that is technically wrong if you include best gift ever, which you should because it's fucking great. So me pulling this number out of my ass, while well, it seemed right, it was not technically right. I think I also made a comment earlier about how there was no song in this or in episode 100. Well, there's no vocal song in episode 100. Technically, you do get Octavian uh, vinyl playing a song together. So it, it does count. So I, I feel like I got to make that clear. But anyways, I'm going to go drink some water. I'm going to go eat some ice cream. And then, including best gift ever, 220, 221, and 222.